Hi, and thanks for joining us for this uh, session on leadership, how to shift your team from I to we as we look at the upcoming Next Generation Science Standards and the implications for leading our teams uh, amidst this change that's taking place nationwide. My name is Francis Vigent. I am the CEO here at NOATOM, and I'm a former teacher myself. I spent about 10 years in the classroom at both the high school and uh, elementary, early elementary and middle school level. So I've covered it all. And leadership is something that I'm quite passionate about. Uh, leadership really defines the effectiveness of our schools and our communities on so many levels, and it is incredibly difficult to not only create change, but really sustain an impact without adequate leadership. So part of the goal here today, and I hope uh, as you've signed up with this, uh, you'll be thinking a little bit more about how climate and culture emerges. So that's the first thing we're going to take a look at. We're going to take a look from the perspective of research, but not just the research itself, but the implications and applications of that research uh, for our roles in K-12 education. Next, what we're going to do is take a look at how next generation science inquiry differs from the traditional content push that uh, most of our classrooms have become accustomed to or were really taught uh, to deliver STEM instruction in that sort of mode. Next, what we're going to take a look at is not just the sort of function of the group of our tribe, but really how individuals function. Uh, because the reality is, is that our schools are collections of individuals. And so some of the sort of research-based um, behaviors that we have to be mindful of and also have strategies to overcome as we deal with what we would call large shocks like new policy and this next generation science standards. Finally, what we're going to do is take a look at how we can pull these ideas uh, not only from how organizational behavior uh, research applies to K-12 education and research on individual habits apply, but how we can really use that knowledge to lead our teams and our districts to uh, higher ground, and especially in the context of science. So without uh, further ado, we're going to jump right in here. I'm just going to let you know if you're here on the live webinar, on the right side of your screen there will be a question box. I'll do my best to keep this to about an hour hopefully a little bit less, and go ahead and feel free to pop questions in the question box at any time. I'll do my best to answer those. Uh, we do have a few hundred people uh, logged in on this webinar, so I may not be able to get to all the questions. I'll give you my email address, and you're also welcome to uh, reach out to any of the emails that you've gotten and reply and get your qu questions answered that way. Wonderful. So let's jump right into it. Each of us as individuals, since uh, the dawn of time, since there have been humans, there have been tribes. We are members of tribes. And there are tribal council meetings that take place every day in the schools, in lunchrooms, everywhere there are people, there are tribal meetings taking place. Now, this picture is from Survivor, I suppose, maybe fa some famous tribal councils here. But what's very interesting is that outside of reality TV, things like Super Bowl parties are examples of tribal council meetings. It's not sort of the uh, fictitious, um, competitive one person against another, but really meetings of like-minded individuals, people who share values. Um, and so someone I want to introduce you to right away is David Logan. Uh, David Logan was a researcher at Harvard and really came across a very interesting epiphany back in 2008. From, two, from 1998 to 2008, what he had done with his colleagues was really look into tribal behaviors. They looked at 24,000 people over about 10 years and were really interested in how the tribes form, how they behave, and how they're led. And in 2008, they were debriefing, just what you see here, um, they were debriefing Super Bowl parties. And at that time in 2008, February 2008, there was uh, sort of an unknown character that had made his way into the political scene named Barack Obama. 
and a favored, uh, well-known political ch person out there, Hillary Clinton, who you may have heard of, and they were vying for the Democratic nomination. And you might say, well, what does any of this have to do with education? Well, what's interesting is that these uh, two individuals, while Barack Obama was largely unknown and Hillary Clinton was really well known, um, the professional pollsters had put out a poll that predicted that Hillary Clinton would get the Democratic nomination basically by a landslide, clear winner. And in debriefing, David Logan and his um, colleagues asked these football parties, who do you think is the going to be the nominee? And they picked Barack Obama. And so, lo and behold, Barack Obama gets the nomination. And so they sit back and they go, wow, how is it that these tribal gatherings, these Super Bowl parties, had better predictive ability than the professional pollsters about the outcome of a Democratic nomination? And so, as it turns out, um, tribes form naturally around ideas and values. And so, tribes form, uh, they, they have a central culture, they have a climate, and they have ideas and values in common. So by polling the tribes, what they didn't really understand at the time was that they were essentially uh, polling Democratic uh, committee delegates because Democratic committee delegates are hyper-local and these tribes are hyper-local and they're loosely organized. Um, they are by choice. Nobody sort of runs for office in a Super Bowl party, um, but yet they are sort of coming together around their ideas and their values. In schools, we see a very similar thing. People will apply to jobs in schools and communities that share their values. They will uh, choose to stay in schools that share their values and culture. And so what happens is, is that over time, depending on the values of a school or of a community and that culture, um, we start to see sort of a, uh, an emerging influence or sort of an emerging climate. And so what um, David Logan's group determined was that when they looked across these 24,000 people, and again, these 24,000 people were not just educators. There were schools and educators in amongst them, but they looked at Fortune 500 companies. They looked at some small businesses. Uh, they looked at government uh, agencies. They, they began to realize that people were basically falling into one of five types of tribes. And these tribes actually had stages and they had sort of overarching views of the world. And so sort of lowest level to highest level, what they discovered was that kind of in the beginning here, you have a stage one tribe of individuals who sort of come together around life is terrible. And I'll go into these more in depth in a moment. A stage two tribe is a group of individuals who sort of find common bonds around my life stinks or life is bad. Uh, stage three tribe members sort of come together around this idea that I'm the best or I'm better than you are or I'm better than they are. Stage four tribe members come together around this idea that we are great and they are not. And so what's, what's important and interesting to point out here is that at stage four, this is where tribes become self-aware because it's, you can see it right in the language, that idea of we. And stage five being sort of the highest level stage, and it's actually considered um, unstable, is this idea that life is great. And so I want to kind of uh, paint you the picture of what each of these look like um, in the following slides. But what you see in these percentages below are the percentages of individuals that we find in sort of society on average in each of these stages. Uh, and what you'll notice is it approximates a normal distribution. Most people rate, can sort of get into stage three and that's where they get stuck and stay. Uh, some people progress beyond that. So let's take a little uh, closer look. Level one tribes really uh, Level one tribe members are lone wolf individuals who um, really are disconnected in a, in, in a big way. Um, the reason I put lone wolf up here is that really 
level one tribe members are they are people who sort of lash out against life. So when we think of school shootings, when we think of gang footmen, terror cells, things like this, these are level one tribes that have such a, um, they're in such a bad place that they don't even see anything beyond everything being bad. And so they, when they do come together with others, they really lash out irrationally to try and deal with that bad. Level two tribes are sort of individuals that are a step beyond that. It's not that everything is bad, it's that my life is bad. And I put a picture up here from an experience that I had in sort of a level two type environment. Um, last summer, I somehow ended up on Spirit Airlines and not being sort of uh, above a, a value airline, I thought, oh, this is great. Look at the Spirit Airlines. And bought a cheap ticket on my way home from Denver, and I got stuck in Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport, and life was bad. Um, it's maybe hard to tell from the picture here, but literally the flight was delayed 14 hours, there was no food options, there were no seats available in the terminal, literally several thousand people had been delayed, they were stuck here, and everybody was sort of in the same boat. What's kind of interesting though is that um, people dealt with it differently. So there were no food options, one small bathroom, all of this. The airline was sort of a tribe to culture. Uh, what they <laughs> it's a, for the sake of value, um, everything else could be bad. And so they were overbooking flights, they were running planes close together, and so the organizational practices were kind of ignorant, and they ended up making their employees helpless. And so the culture was of the airline in dealing with the situation was not only helpless, but it was really kind of dumb. They were literally, the, they being the, the employees, were literally hiding from customers. Um, you couldn't find an employee around. If they came around a corner, they would go and hide. And so I'm not saying that the employees were dumb people, but the culture of the company and the lack of values, other than just sort of being low cost, led to a, a negative culture, a bad culture, that basically forced the employee into the situation where all they could do to cope was hide. And so uh, what was interesting was is that in amongst now the travelers, you have some tribe kind of one people, some tribe two people, and so on. And what was happening was that you could see sort of these tribe one people lining up and threatening, literally threatening lawsuits and screaming at the one airline staff member they could find by a service desk. The level two people were sort of sitting in the chairs saying, boy, my life's bad. Look at, we're stuck in this situation. And then the level three people, so level two people sort of wallow. It's my life is bad. I'm stuck in this. The level three people kind of got on their horse <laughs> and rode over to a better airline. And they said to themselves, I'm better than this group. I'm better than this airline. I'm done with these shenanigans. I'm going to head over to JetBlue, which if you don't know, JetBlue is actually number one airline for customer satisfaction. And I'm not endorsing anybody, but as a contrast, um, they've been voted number one. So if, if you're a level three person, then I'm better than they are. You're going to do the smarter thing, and you're going to show the airline, I'll take my money elsewhere. And what do you think a tribe three person would do when they get home? they would sort of pro kind of proclaim the injustice and their betterness by telling everyone how smart they were to have cleverly escaped such an inferior company and circumstances. So tribe three people, if you think about tribe two as being people who view life as, my life is bad, and really l very low empowerment and very much subjected to what comes along. Tribe three people view themselves really as the leaders of the tribe two people, smarter than they are. And so they're going to be clever, and they'll get around it, and they'll show others. Tribe four people, and if you recognize this guy, this is Richard Branson, or now Sir Richard Branson. 
Tribe 4 people, again, I said earlier, Tribe 4 is where the group becomes self-aware. They have the idea that we, as a group, we are better than they are. So how can we, as a group, be better than they are? So thinking collectively, sharing values, Tribe 4 people sort of go out and they scout out opportunities and they bring that back and if it matches the values of the group, um, they are agents of change and actually um, have these sort of self-aware tools to then uh, kind of cope with shocks. So if you know anything about Sir Richard Branson and just sort of playing out the rest of the airline analogy here, uh, he found himself in a similar situation. At this point in time, he was a poor guy running a failing newspaper and a failing record shop, um, and he was stuck in an airport, just like that other airport picture I stuck, I stuck up there. And he shared sort of the similar circumstances. He, was, he had a canceled flight. Everybody was hanging around, but he dealt with it in a level four type of way. When the airline wasn't supportive, he responded by banding together with the other passengers and he said, you know what, we're better than this treatment. If they're not going to help us, we want to get where we're going. I'm going to charter a plane. Who's in it? And this is a true story. So literally, everyone who shared the value of getting home said, count me in. And in the matter of a couple hours, they had chartered a plane and they were all flying back home. The group basically gathered around their values of what uh, they wanted to accomplish why they were there, um, and Richard Branson sort of led the charge here and got that plane chartered, and next thing you know, they were in a better place. They had solved their own issue. And so this is where the shared values and group self-awareness really comes into play. They were not sort of um, alone. There wasn't one lone individual going off and chartering a plane because he couldn't do that on his own. He didn't have the ability to do that, but as a group uh, and actually moving himself into that leadership position of the group by sort of pr sparking the change at that moment, um, he was able to accomplish for himself something that he couldn't have done on his own and in fact accomplish it for the entire group. So this is you know, really a key transition point. And then the highest level, and I'll stick with Richard Branson and Airlines here, uh, is that life is good. People who are at a level five are thinking even beyond sort of that immediate need and evolution to really the global issues and problems. And if you know anything about Sir Richard Branson, he goes from being this type of um, struggling entrepreneur, uh, record sort of shop and student newspaper. And after this experience with the airlines, um, among many other successes, he thought that the idea that there was a monopoly between airline routes um, from the US to the UK was just a crazy thing and that travelers can and should have a better experience, that they deserve more options and better service and better price. So he decided to swing out at the big airlines and he started Virgin Atlantic. And if you've flown Virgin Atlantic, you know it's been a success. It hasn't always been a success. He was a disruptor. He had to go through a lot of trials and tribulations, he's saved the airline from bankruptcy multiple times in its history, especially early history. But what I want to point out here is that at, by progressing from level four to level five, what Richard was doing was he was trying to solve a global issue, something that was beyond his community of travelers, that group of people who were delayed, to something that would solve an issue for all travelers, um, with basically without boundaries in a sense. So. Level five in the research, level five tribes are unstable. So there are sort of these epiphanies where people move into level five, but they tend to kind of slide back to level four. And, and people are flexible. The, these tribal levels are something that they move through over time. And while people can get stuck at a level, hopefully um, they're transitioning up. And so we'll talk about how those transitions happen and how you as a leader can actually help provoke that transition and also uh, have direction as you're provoking these these switches. So thinking here about uh, Logan's research, and it was Logan, King, and Fisher, um, keep in mind that most people are stuck at that stage three, focused on I. 
Okay, so stage three people, you even hear it in their language. I, I, I. When you hear people at level four, you often hear we, what we think. At level two, you will hear my, so focused on my needs. How does this really uh, reflect itself in a K-12 setting? So let's take a look. Sort of the stage one application of this tribal theory is life is terrible. Um, how does that get reflected? The kids have no chance. Okay, so again, thinking about this as the, the mental sort of paradigm of somebody or a member of this tribe, the children have no chance. Um, they tend to be isolated uh, or isolating. Uh, it's me versus them. Uh, things are hopeless. There's really no way out. There's no way up. Why bother? Uh, there are very few people who are stage one type people in K-12 education, mainly because they're not going to last. Um, education in, in general is about bringing children to a higher place, um, bringing communities to a higher place. You're, you're actually teaching something. You're creating opportunities. Um, you're developing awareness. And so uh, people who are stage one, uh, we're talking about you know, less than 2%. When you go to stage two, you find an awful lot more folks. My life is bad. So the kind of things that you'll hear from stage two tribe members are things like, you know, this, it doesn't work because there's no common planning time. There's been no, we can't be successful, there's no professional development. The class sizes are too large. The spectrum of student need is so wide. The parents are absentee. Um, you know, it's this administrator or that administrator or the politics. This should have happened, but I got cut off at the pass. Um, or just being purely jaded. Um, you know, yeah, this is a great idea. It's all rainbows. And if we just you know, just hang out, it's going to go away like everything else. Um, the idea of sort of drama and negative emotions. It's interesting though because in stage two you also have some real gritty doers. I mean, people who you find at stage two may have all these characteristics that sort of build camaraderie among the members um, and prevent them from really experiencing success at a really high level, but yet they're very committed um, to what they're doing. They're committed oftentimes. And so, so that's sort of a, an interesting paradox. Um, as the language shifts up from sort of a focus on my bad teaching experience, uh, people maybe get their feet under themselves and they start to think I'm the best. And so you'll hear a very oftentimes opinionated eyes. And this isn't just you know aimed at teachers or administrators, um, you can see this actually in students as well, uh, different flavors of the same thing. Um, so that kind of I opinionatedness, it's, you know, um, here's how I do it. Uh, measuring, what's interesting is stage three members will measure themselves against others' performance. Because remember, at stage three, by being the best, you have to be better than somebody else. And as an individual, being the best, you have to be better than the people around you. And so this is this causes tension. And so it's very image oriented, it's very critical, can be very perfectionist. Um, and stage two people can become easily overwhelmed because to remain the best, you have to be better than these other folks. So you're always in a position of sort of one-upping or closing out or sort of putting up a wall. Um, and as new things come out, it's hard to be the best at something new. It's threatening. And so that's overwhelming. Uh, when things aren't black and white, uh, that can be alarming because it's hard to know if you're the best. Um, as the best person, uh, there's oftentimes a need to lead and have others follow, not just adults, but also the, the children in an K-12 setting. Stage three folks really like set roles. They like to know their role. Um, you know, going outside of that is something that's going to be uncomfortable or something that um, is going to be well accepted. It tends to be sort of type A in nature, um, these stage three tribes. Uh, yet they want to achieve, which is interesting. Sort of similar to stage two being these really gritty doers. 
Um, in stage three, they really want to achieve. Uh, they want to be the best. It's just kind of a funny thing that, um, unfortunately, it's personal best. It's not a group best. And they won't take things at face value. When they, they, they will seek out to be the best to help, but they'll do it secretly. And so they have high expectations of themselves and of their students and others and can even have this sort of sense of entitlement because if I'm the best, I'm sort of entitled to that recognition. I recognize it. I want others to recognize it. Most people, this is as high as they get in, in general. Outside of education or inside of education doesn't matter. Um, we work with engineers. Uh, we work with executives. We work with all these sort of different people. This is where uh, a lot of them get stuck. And so if you've been in the educational sphere for any time, you know that there's an awful lot of people um, that you'll encounter, especially in leadership, uh, who are outside of your sphere who think they know better than you do um, and will let you know that. And so um, it's, not, it's not uncommon outside. This is where the magic happens. So moving from I'm the best, stage four, so that's stage three, stage four is really we, we're great and they're not. <laughs> so you have a se sort of group self-awareness at this point. And so as a group, so you can think of this group, and a tribe, by the way, is not two or three people. A tribe is like 10 to 150 people. So it's, a big, it's bigger than a team, um, so it's not just like two teachers at a grade level. It's a building. You know, a building is a tribe. And so you can, you can see this if you have a district of you know, more than a couple buildings. You can see that there are probably buildings in your district where people believe their life is bad. There are probably buildings where there's people who think they're the best. And there is probably buildings where they think they're great or better than all the others. And so uh, this we're great dynamic is formed around shared values. And that's key for building self-awareness. So having clear values, and really by values what I mean is beliefs. Okay, a value is not good data. Uh, nobody believes in data. Nobody uh, will work tirelessly for data. Now you might say, well, we do in our district. But the reality is, that the data, you know, you can get to 100%. Um, you can dial this back to sort of just history and think about the idea of, a, of if you're from the United States, um, think about the U.S. president taking the oath of office and swearing to protect and defend the Constitution. The Constitution is a list of beliefs and values that unite the states, that unite us as a country. And that's what people are willing to fight for. That's why people, that's why we had a civil war. Um, it's why we, um, w people are willing to sign up and, and die for our country. It's because they really believe in these values. And uh, if, it was, if it was something about income, um, you know, so nobody's swearing an oath of office to uh, increased income. Because people would be like, well, you know, income goes up, income goes down, whatever. Um, it's the values, it's the things that we believe in. And so every building um, has values that are first and foremost established by the principal in that building. Um, and that may be a trickle down from superintendent level and school committee level. But there needs to be a core set of values and beliefs that unite the team members of a building so that as they are saying we, they understand who we are. Just like the Constitution helps us as American citizens understand who we are and what we value. Um, members of the Stage 4 tribe are motivated by possibility. That's the thing. They're the things that we believe in. Just like we believe in justice and equality and the rights of free speech and things like that, um, it doesn't mean that reality is perfect. Uh, but it's, it's what we hold up, it's what we believe, and it's what we work towards and what we try to correct um, to get to that place. And so by having these values, um, that's what you're working towards, that's what unites you, and that's what you can be optimistic about. Um, the data is going to go up and down, but other things are, are, are constant uniting factors. And so you can get around this jadedness 
Uh, stage four people are at the beginnings of idealism. They're self-aware, mission-oriented, um, and they value their tribe over their self. Now, that doesn't mean that they're sort of self-effacing, but what it means is that, that the investment, they're willing to invest the time not because they're getting an award or getting recognition or they're the best personally, but they're willing to do it because it's going to better their school or their district. And it depends on kind of where the boundaries of this we are, but it's at a minimum the school. And so uh, that's key. Uh, some of the little kind of downfalls of stage four is they can get caught up in the positives, losing sight of key results. Um, so, uh, you know, it can be a little too touchy-feely at times, and so a little too soft on on the results. So having that unifying um, value, in, and that's the role of leadership. It's, again, not to sort of send people off and, you know, lose focus, but then to, you know, bring back and, and actually measure um, and think about what's being measured in light of our values. And there's not, and when I say measure, I don't want you to think that I'm meaning only standardized testing. Um, you know, there's a lot of different measurements. Um, of school climate and and values. Stage five is that life is great. And life is great as it applies to K-12 can have some downsides. Um, so life is great is where you see folks going out and doing really unique and far out things. Um, maybe, you know, you may see a whole class going to a foreign country at fifth grade. Um, it's not necessarily practical for everybody um, in K-12 education to be taking their fifth grade classes to a foreign country. Um, there are realistic boundaries to that. However, somebody who's a stage five tribe member would say, well, you know, this is, this is an approach that I'm taking to solve the issue or that, that you know, can be taken to solve the issue of cultural awareness. And so in a way, they can be fighting a personal war. Um, what's interesting is, is that out of these sort of stage five endeavors, that really good things do pop up. It just, uh, there needs to be awareness that oftentimes there's sort of a naive or impractical or even overly idealistic side to it, which depending on your functional constraints, um, you know, may or may not be an issue, um, but it's something to keep in mind. Also for stage five people, new is often more important than effective, and that's sort of a bit of an Achilles heel too. Stage five people are so focused on the issue and, and so risk-taking that sometimes um, the fact that something's new is more important than the fact that it's rational or effective or has any level of you know proven nature or sustainability to it. Uh, stage five tribes tend to have strong internal frames of res reference. They can be um, somewhat narcissistic, and so that's sort of a sign of some stage five type behavior. And uh, they are very autonomous. It's very hard to sort of break through and and sort of um, go from you know deal with a stage five person at times because again they are often fighting a sort of a personal war with an issue and not necessarily the realities in a circumstance. Now you can see why stage five would be somewhat unstable because to sustain that sort of um, innovation, constant innovation and constant risk taking and dealing with learning things that weren't expected and for, sort of falling back um, takes its toll. And so it's important, too, that to, or to strike out and have innovations that there's a support of a group. And so coming back to that we of stage four is, you know, typically that kind of fluctuation that you see. Now, in order, this is very, very important. Stage, when somebody is in a particular stage, the research um, that Logan and his colleagues did showed that members of the tribe let's say a stage three tribe, can only hear the language of the stage above and the stage below. So if you can imagine, somebody who's speaking a stage four language of you know, values, look what we can do, so on and so forth, really um, acting in a self-aware, idealistic sort of way and communicating that, is going to be completely ignored 
by stage two people. They're going to say, yeah, we have values and we have this and all of that is great, rainbows, because I know, I as a stage two people, a person, a tribe member, there's no common planning time. Our class sizes are too large. My class of students, you know, can't do this. My parents are this. My system, you know, doesn't support its teachers or so on. My principal is absentee. So the my people are not going to be able to hear the we leader or the we people. So what you have to do here is you have to insert sort of the language at a level in which that person or tribe can hear. And oftentimes, when there's change going on in districts, or there's churn, or there's new principal in a role, that you have multiple tribes in the same building. You might have some stage two people, some stage three people, and you might be a stage four leader. And so leaders of tribal leaders, so the leader of the tribes is somebody who understands the language and can speak the language, and if you want to be a tribal leader, that's what you have to learn. You have to learn to identify the language, to speak the language, and to insert yourself when you see somebody from a stage three to speak stage three or stage four language. And what you want to do is you want to begin transitioning the language and the focus away from the stage that a person is operating at and towards the higher level stage. The other thing that the research shows is that people cannot skip stages. They don't skip stages. What they do is they transition through them. They can transition through stages quickly, but they have to transition through a stage. They can't skip over it. It doesn't work that way. Okay. So, and I'm sure there's a bunch of questions about this. So feel free as we're going through to um, throw your questions in there. How does this sort of play out? I would pause it to you. So when you look at those percentages, and I'm going to back up here for a second just to show you those percentages. This is the average for populations of just people. So basically a normal distribution. Most people being stuck at that 49. I would posit that in education what we typically see is much more like this. The average is in the middle of course around stage three, but really in urban settings as school districts become larger, uh, people shift down. It becomes skewed to the left around stage two because there tends to be a command and control culture uh, where there are leaders and there are followers. And uh, unfortunately, the focus on extrinsic motivators like data and testing feeds right into this. Um, and people become uh, divorced from the purpose of what they're doing. So it's not about we. It's about trying to be the best or trying to follow along. And so you have many more followers than you do oftentimes leaders and the leadership is not shared um, and that can happen as a virtue of size and also we're going to take a look at in a second around uh, some of the research in terms of how people view challenges. What's interesting is in suburban districts what we see it tends to be skewed to the right so again thinking about that idea of we we are a, a team also smaller okay it's easier to have sort of a, a tribe of 10 to 150 when you have 10 to 150 people to deal with and not 1,000 to you know 5,000 people that are part of your school or district. So in suburban schools, we tend to see it shift to the right. So you see more of this we language. You see more people striking out and doing innovative things. That's why you see more you know one-to-one uh, -one initiatives and STEAM labs and um, you know, online learning and distance learning and blended learning and all these sort of things tend to happen in suburban schools um, for a number of reasons. And, you know, those are not purely cultural. Some of that's resources. Some of that is training. Some of that, you know, there's validity to that. But there is also more of a culture to enable people to strike out on their own uh, to bring something back and also the individual members understand the values more often of their tribe. It's clearer so they're m more likely to go find something and bring it back and say, hey guys, what do you think of that? Can we do this? And so that's very, very different. That's stage four, stage five stuff, not stage two, stage three stuff that we're seeing on the other side. So the average hides a lot is what I'm trying to say here. Okay. 
So just keeping an eye on the time, I want to make sure that we uh, are moving along. That's the foundation. So I want you, and probably as I've been describing these tribes and sort of these tribal profiles, you've either been picturing yourself in situations in the past or picturing some of your team members or districts or situations you've worked in. What I want to look at now is um, how next generation science standards are going to play out. So what we just looked at was really sort of organizational behavior of teams and sort of the profiles of these teams and individuals sort of opting into. You know, why would I opt into a stage three tribe? I mean, it's because I, I share that value um, because I'm somebody who sees myself as the best. Um, David Logan gives an example of stage three people uh, being sort of like a medical doctors in an elevator where one doctor says, oh, wow, you know, I had a rough more, you know, rough morning, great morning, I saved a guy's life. And then the doctor next to him says, oh, wow, that's great. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I just got off a shift where I was doing brain surgery, teaching, you know, 15 medical students to save lives. And then the third doctor saying, well, you know, I just left a meeting where we were rewriting the residency program that's going to redefine surgery and medicine uh, for the for the whole future. So that's a that's a tribal meeting of you know th stage three people one upping each other, um, showing how they're the best. Um, as we think about education, what's going to happen with these next generation science standards is they're redefining effective STEM instruction, and that is going to upset those stage three people and stage two people because they're not really equipped for the change, um, and in the process of sort of wanting to be the best or uh, one up, um, it's going to be difficult because it's all going to be new, which is going to generate pushback. So let's just take a quick look at what these new things are. One thing that's new is this definition of science and engineering, this idea of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, that science is knowledge from experimentation and that engineering is an application of science where engineers use their knowledge of science to solve problems. Those are specific definitions. Historically, the idea of science and engineering was that scientists have a lot of content knowledge. They know things that are sort of sciency, and that engineering is building stuff. Well, that's not true. It's not, that's not the definition of science. It's not the definition of engineering moving forward. And in fact, this forms a kind of cycle. The other thing is that I don't care if it's kindergarten or 12th grade level, that the focus of instruction has been dis discipline focused, content knowledge focused. It's really been about shoveling content into students' minds and getting them to recall it. These new standards are performance expectations. That means that students are going to be required to demonstrate their understanding. And that understanding is going to fall into three categories not only disciplinary core ideas, which is content, but the practices and the processes of science and engineering. The, and what that means is the skills that scientists and engineers use to develop the discipline, to develop the content. Cross-cutting concepts are all about the systems, the way that the content behaves and interacts. These are very new ideas, uh, big changes. There's a new definition of effective STEM instruction. Effective STEM instruction, this is it. It's from the National Research Council. It goes back to 2011. It's really infused throughout these new standards. Effective STEM instruction uh, capitalizes on students' early interests, so it's nurturing. It identifies and builds on what they know, so it's scaffolding. And it provides them with experiences to engage them in the practices. So the experience in the classroom is supposed to engage students in the skills of science and engineering and in a way that sustains their interest. So the scope and sequence is going to have to not only scaffold, but it's going to have to move at a quick pace that is sustaining student interest. Um, it's not going to be about having a whole trimester about earth science and rocks and minerals. It's going to be about inserting um, knowledge in sequential sort of order, building it intentionally and, and taking those practices across all disciplines so that students are in the role of scientist and engineer. And that's what you see on the right, 
What you see on the left is that sort of old model of sort of, um, of literally modeling and then having students mirror back uh, what was modeled. And so I'll show you that here. Um, this is the traditional model that the content is out there and the teacher is the content specialist, so it somehow flows through them. And even as an elementary teacher who may be a generalist, the teacher being the sage on the stage, the traditional model is I know what you don't know, so I, the content flows through me, I'm going to model it for you, I'm going to demonstrate the phenomenon, and I'm going to explain what. And as the student, your job is to recall the facts, repeat the demonstration, summarize what was told to you, and go through the motions you were shown. That's no longer adequate or sufficient. A next generation model puts the student and the teacher and the content and concept uh, sort of system behavior kind of separates them all. So the student has to learn these skills and use them to develop and use the content and to be able to access and uh, relate to the systems dynamics and that cross-cutting concept. The teacher monitors both and helps adjust the supports. Okay, and the student has the teacher as kind of a go-to there. So the teacher's redirecting and monitoring. That's what you see on the left. Okay, adjusting the support, helping students to understand how to engage, engage appropriately, and actually provoking thought. That's the teacher's job is to provoke thought, not to be the expert. On the student side, it's their job to develop and use the content to uh, engage appropriately, to actually engage in using their skills to solve problems and answer questions, and to be able to describe what they're seeing in terms of its, syst its uh, system behavior and dynamics. So this is very, very different, okay? And um, uh, it means, and I'll just quickly some pictures, it means that it's not the sage on the stage, but actually things like Socratic dialogue. Okay, it's not an issue of, and Socratic dialogue being uh, asking thought-provoking questions that require higher order thinking in order to answer, even in a group setting. It means students planning their investigations, not being given something to copy, okay, or to just follow. And uh, environments are not going to look like students sitting in rows filling out worksheets or just reading textbooks to become aware, but really to engage in the practices and to do it in small groups, okay, to test their ideas no matter what kind of environment they're in. And this is a, a quick picture I took, um, or I'm using, from one of our programs. Uh, these other pictures are from programs here in the US. But this is one from uh, IDP camps that we um, are working with in northern Iraq. We have another um, starting in Jordan, hopefully soon. Um, same behaviors, OK? Same skills, students engaged as scientists and engineers. Once they engage in that, it's all purposeful. They're analyzing evidence. They're debriefing sort of bringing their thinking to the table. And again, it's because of a focus on higher order thinking. So that creating, evaluating, and analyzing happens simultaneously. So these are all major shifts that are coming down that are going to hit whatever level tribe you have or tribes in your district or in your, in your building, uh, even in your community. Because remember, teachers are members of tribes. Administrators are members of tribes. Parents and students are also members of tribes. Um, and everybody can be all over the place. So uh, this creating, evaluating, and analyzing is something that's going to need to take place simultaneously in the classroom because the focus is not at awareness level. It's not good enough or acceptable for students to be aware that science and engineering exists and what it is and how it's defined. Uh, it's not sufficient to know about science or that textbook. You know, we can read the textbook and we can know all about what scientists and engineers have done. Um, that's not sufficient either kind of the old kit model of, you know, take the rocks out and scratch them to find out how hard they are, that performance readiness is not sufficient. But really, we're looking at mastery readiness of skills, mastering skills. And so that is especially um, for people who see themselves, even though they may not recognize it, as sort of these tribe three members, um, the experts on the content that most likely want to get up and be on stage and transfer what they know to the students um, and be able to kind of check all those content boxes, this is very, very different, okay? Because mastery, we're t what we're talking about in mastery is mastery of skills specific to the discipline that then can be generalized and used over many different contexts to solve any problem or to answer any question. Now, 
this is going to change. Uh, so thinking about this sort of sh the shock of next generation science standards, how is it going to change uh, individual and team leadership? And it's important now that you know about the five different tribes and sort of how they come together to think about individuals. Because remember, a tribe is just made up of people and people are individuals. And there are certain things that we know people struggle with. And one of them is called functional fixedness. And you may be familiar with the candle problem, or maybe not. So I'll ask you, just looking at this picture, you have a candle, a box of tacks, and matches. How can you stick the candle to the wall? How can you attach the candle to the wall? And you look at it, and you're probably thinking, well, we could take a tack and maybe try to tack the candle to the wall. And I'll tell you, the wall is a cork board. And other people might say, well, I'm more clever than that. What we could do is, is we could light the match, we could heat the candle, and we could stick the candle to the wall. And then I might say to you, well, I, you know, I guess it depends on how you view the problem. So here you have a box of tacks and matches. What if I said to you that you have a box and tacks and matches? You might look at that and say, oh, that's easy. What you probably want to do is take the tacks tack the box to the wall, and you know you can use the, the matches to light the candle if you want. So the issue of functional fixedness is the issue that when you see a candle and a box of tacks and matches, that it, the human brain immediately says, the candle needs to be attached to the wall. How can I do that? All I have is tacks and matches. We see the problem sort of one way. And by sort of adjusting some of the variables here very slightly, we can begin to see the problem in a different way and actually see different solutions to the problem. And this is, goes back, this is a famous Carl uh, Dunker's candle problem. It goes back to 1945. Um, this is <laughs> old research um, out of Clark University. But the connection between functional fixedness and the new standards is that people who are in the role of teaching science, whoever they are. Um, they can be after school providers, they can be classroom teachers, generalists, specialists, whatever. The problem is that children need to learn science. The functional fixedness is that this is how we do, this is how we do that. Um, and what we need to do is we need to see the new standards as not the way it used to be, but really, for what science and engineering really is, that it is three-dimensional, that it involves practices and processes. Yes, it involves disciplinary content, uh, but it also involves system behavior. And that our goal is not to have children memorize all the facts the scientists have ever discovered, but in fact, to uh, train them to be critical thinkers, to be able to create and evaluate and analyze critically, and then to take that and be able to apply those skills with the knowledge that they've developed um, to actually extend their understanding as scientists and engineers in the classroom. And so that's going to look different. Okay? And so functional fix fixedness is going to be one of the first issues. And we've already seen this with Common Core ELA and math. Um, if you in your state have had Common Core ELA or math come in, um, there was a set of standards that were in place before, new ones come in, and unfortunately, instead of thinking about the problem and why the standards are the way they are and what they're asking for, a lot of times districts have adopted things um, that do not really reflect alignment to the standards, they're just something else, and next thing you know, a bunch of people who still view the old standards as having been adequate and see the struggle with the new ones run out and say, hey, wait a minute, that candle cannot be attached to the wall with tacks or with a match. And nobody has done the job of saying, well, let's look at this a little differently, because yes, we can. Um, and so that's where, unfortunately, you see a lot of things in the media where people come out uh, quite irate. Now, on the uh, next kind of uh, individual level, so we have one piece is this sort of functional fixedness. Mindset 
is a huge factor. So some uh, a recent piece of research you should know, um, Carol Dweck, and she has a book, uh, Mindset, going back 2006. Um, a career educational researcher sort of saw this trend emerging and decided to actually publish some research about it. She noticed that when groups of students were uh, kind of praised based on their ability versus based on their effort, that it changed their behavior. And sort of the difference in growth versus fixed mindset is probably best encapsulated in the classic story of the tortoise and the hare. And so we all know that hares win races and tortoises have no hope because that's what the story we've been told has taught us. That the functional moral of the story is unless the hare gets lazy or makes mistakes, it's a given that the tortoise loses. And so we think of tortoises as the losers. Um, the undertone here is fixed. Tortoise really can't run a race and a hare can. Uh, so in this scenario, the value of hard work is really irrational because winning the race is based on the luck, for the tortoise, is based on luck. And for the hare, it's basically predetermined because they are fast. It's their characteristic. And so what um, sort of this observation that Carol Dweck made was is that when children were told you're so smart or you're so good at something, they viewed themselves as the hare. And so they said, wow, I'm good. Um, and they expected to sort of win. And if students weren't told they were smart or, you know, sort of good at something, they tried hard or, or you know, sort of was in the other group, um, you know, they were sort of, I guess, if they couldn't be smart, then they were going to be kind of the loser. <laughs> so this, you know, sort of this paradigm emerges where you're either the winner or the loser, and it's fixed. Now, in the case of a tortoise or a hare, if the story, you know, was reality, um, you, we're talking about DNA. We're talking about organisms. We're talking about, um, you know, different evolutions here. What's important about mindset is, is to realize that we're humans and that intelligence is fluid and that we have the ability to learn. And so while we may not be at a performance level that we want to be at or at number one, we can actually get ourselves there through hard work. And so at a teacher level, sort of a fixed mindset that we see emerge in buildings all the time that's accidentally reinforced all the time is that people are identified as content specialists or they have a science background or they have a math background or they worked in industry or they have great kids or an active parent group or from an affluent community. These are the people we, in a fixed way, identify as the hares of teaching. The people who we identify as the tortoises, well, those are the generalists, or if they have an inclusion class, or if they have no prep time, or if they're from an urban community, or if they pull from a less affluent side of town. Okay, so by bringing that into the discussion, what we're doing is, is we're actually putting fixed labels that then sort of begin to define behavior. And one of the really interesting aspects of Carol's research had to do with giving children tasks, so puzzle tasks, I think they were. And to sort of paraphrase it for you, what they did was they took two groups of children and they gave them these puzzles. And they gave one group, the pu and they were, you know, the first set of puzzles was easy. So they gave out the set of puzzles. They say to the kids, OK, here you go, make the puzzle. So the kids make the puzzle. And then they come back and say, wow. To one group, they say, boy, you worked really hard on that. Nice job. And to the other group, they said, wow, you're so smart. Nice job. And then they said to them, would you like to do another puzzle? So this time, they gave them another puzzle. And this time, it was harder. And they went back to the same groups. And they said to one group, wow, look how hard you work. Nice job. And to the other group, they went and the same smart group. They said, wow, you're so smart. Now again, these kids were not necessarily any smarter, but they were told that. So then they went back to the children and they said, well, they said, would you like to try a harder puzzle? What do you think the two groups said? The group that were told, 
wow, nice job. You work so hard. Look at that. They said, yeah, I'll take that. I'm up for a challenge. I, like, I love a challenge. The students who were told they were so smart, when they heard there was a harder puzzle coming, they said, no thanks, all set. So they disengaged. And so this is where Carol talks about this idea of a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset and people who are in a fixed mindset living under this sort of tyranny of now. Because what happens is, is that that fixed mindset that you are a smart student or you are the content specialist or you are the number one, when that's reinforced, what happens is, is that those individuals view that as sort of a title um, and they run from failure because taking a risk risks the title of number one or, or the designation of being smart. If those children, and it's, it's interesting, if they would have engaged in a harder puzzle, they would have um, been threatening their smart status if they failed. That's sort of the implication here. And so in a fixed mindset, oftentimes um, in, in millennials, this is something you can read in the media um, all over. It's an, in, it's an industry issue where uh, millennials often grew up with sort of lots and lots of praise about how great and how special and how smart they were. And they are having a hard time getting through the day without praise. And they have a, a deep fear of the loss of status and failure. On the flip side, um, Carol talks about a growth mindset as being the power of yet. And so when uh, hard work is praised and process is praised and sort of investment and effort towards a goal, then what happens is, is that those individuals engage in harder tasks, they process error, they learn from it, they learn to cor correct it, and uh, as a result, they're more confident, they're more persistent, um, there's more stability, and destiny, in their case, is not an issue of losing a title or status, but it's really looking at what they want to invest their time in, so it's really what they choose. And so um, mindset is really powerful. So when you look at, your, at the culture and the climate of your school, you, you're going to have a tribe or tribes, but within those tribes, um, it may be homogeneous or heterogeneous, there's going to be a, a degree of sort of that functional fixedness and also some degree of either fixed or growth mindset. Now, if you have people who are of a growth mindset, it, growth mindsets do not lend themselves to sort of being stuck. Um, they lend themselves, as it says, to growth. And so um, people tend to transition up to level four and level five quickly. If people are stuck in the fixed, uh, not so much. Um, it's harder. You need to begin switching that. So. Uh, to co overcome kind of the fixed, sort of the functional fixedness, um, it's trying to view, help being in agitated view problems differently. In the case of mindset, it's praising the process and praising the effort and really um, not giving rewards, sort of saying, well, if you put the effort in, then you're going to get X, Y, Z reward, but really to look for the effort where it's happened and then praise it after the fact and encourage the behavior that way. One other quick thing to think about in terms of individuals, and this is a very famous study that goes was first done uh, back in the 70s. Um, it's out of Stanford, and actually um, Carol I, was out of Stanford at least uh, with her research um, uh, during some points of her career. But uh, individual willpower matters, and this is a study that was called or is, has been sort of uh, referred to as the marshmallow study. And it was done with like three or four year olds. And what they did was is they brought children in and they played with them and they were friendly and they said to the kids, you know what, here's a marshmallow. If you will sit and wait 15 minutes, we'll give you two marshmallows. You can have two for waiting 15 minutes. If you can't wait 15 minutes, you can have one. So, you know, it's up to you. And they did this with uh, a lot of children. It was something like 600 children. And then they followed them for 18 years. And what they found was that some children, uh, as soon as the person left the room, uh, ate the marshmallow. Other children would sit and wait, roll the marshmallow on their face, sniff it, stare at it, but they would wait. The person would come back, they'd get their two marshmallows. And what was interesting was is as they followed these children, 18 years later, they found that the children who could say no to themselves and who waited for that second marshmallow uh, had better adjustment, 
better, they had, they uh, registered um, greater wealth, happiness, popularity, uh, better grades. So they were sort of, in many ways, overall more successful um, by some characteristics of, uh, that some people would define characteristics of success. So the ability to say no is a key factor. Now, it's a key factor for children, and it's something that's visible at a very early age. It's very important for adults as well. One of the issues that we have uh, right now is that we don't really live, society at this point in time does not support, we do not live in a culture that supports saying no. Uh, and there are times when, uh, as educators, we need to stand up and say no. As leaders, we need to stand up and say no. Sometimes that's, um, that's to curriculum or testing. Sometimes that's to over-testing. Sometimes um, that's to the, the way that we're being asked to do something. Um, shutting down school for an entire month of test preparation hopefully is something that our communities are strong enough um, to stand up and say no to because we value other things. And this is where values come in again and the power of the stage four tribes and up. When you have clear and well-defined values that are beliefs, that are something that extends beyond extrinsic motivators, um, it's very, very important. And so building a culture um, that supports saying no in, as individuals but as a group is, is very important and it's healthy and it's, it's important for children to see as well um, and to develop that. So um, just sort of sliding along here, um, I know that we're coming up on the end of our time. We're even a little bit over time here. I, um, I'm going to stick around and uh, take questions in a moment. The, there's a couple more slides here. I have sort of mixed a little bit in along the way. I'll stick around uh, as long as it takes to finish this, probably another 10 minutes or so, and then I'll stick around another 10 or 15 minutes to take questions as long as we have questions. I know there's some waiting here. So when you think about values, um, values are key in motivation. So there are intrinsic motivators and extrinsic motivators. And Dan Arley, um, who is a behavioral economist out of Duke, has spent time at MIT. He's actually an Israeli-American. Um, uh, he did a study really looking at intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, and he found and actually studies even the Fed, the Federal Reserve, um, I believe it was the Federal Reserve of Boston, commissioned studies on this, looking at intrinsic and extrinsic motivators, so in, in the power of them. He found then when people, or they found when people were intrinsically motivated, they were four times more productive than when they were intrins extrinsically motivated. So I'll say that again. When people are intrinsically motivated, so motivated from within by purpose and values and seeing the purpose of what they're doing versus extrinsic motivators, which are like carrot and stick metrics, um, intrinsically motivated people were four times more, had four times greater output. With the exception, there was one exception, mechanical tasks. So putting the cap on a Petri dish or screwing a nut in and being paid by the bolt. Okay, so examples of uh, extrinsic motivators are things like student scores, checking the boxes. Do I have my five, have I done the five parts of my lesson? Check, 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 check. Those are extrinsic motivators. Performance pay would be an ex example of an extrinsic motivator. Getting a promotion as a result of something is an extrinsic motivator. Personal recognition, if you know about it in advance. So doing something in order to be motivated, uh, recognized is an extrinsic motivator. Intrinsic motivation are things that we believe in. They really equate to purpose. So intrinsic examples, uh, motivators would be things like personal connection. Um, you know, I teach because I really value the personal connection that I build with each and every student. Um, and so by having that as a value, and if that's a group value, then anything we do really should reflect that value. Um, in a sense, doing something that is contrary to that should upset everybody. Um, if, if it destroys personal connections, it does not fit with the culture and the values of the group, and so it, it gets cast out, if that makes sense. Things like critical thinking, creative thinking, analytical thinking, student empowerment, nurturing curiosity, these are all big things that we can believe in that infuse purpose and actually are intrinsic motivators. And what I really love about uh, one of Dan Arley's studies was that they paid people to create um, 
little Lego creations. And what they did was is they said, we'll pay you, you know, $3 for every Lego creation. And, you know, if you make it, it's easy to make. Go ahead and we'll pay you $3. So people would sit down, they'd make them. And then uh, they said, you know, we'll, we're going to take these and we're going to put them aside and we'll take them apart later. Um, and so people would make them and, okay. And at some point they would just sort of give up they, because they were being paid like 10 cents less with each one they made. And then they, what they did was is they said that they were going to give them away to children. And what do you think happened? People were willing to make more. They're like, oh, this has a purpose. Um, and then what they did was is they had people make the Bionicles. And instead of putting them on the ground, where they would take them apart later, or giving them away to people, they said they just took it and they started taking it apart right in front of the person as they were making their next one. And so what they found was is that people's uh, engagement, even though they were being paid the same amount, even though the task was the same, their level of engagement and the, the degree to which they were willing to engage and earn money dropped. So people earned less money because they engaged less in the task because the only motivator was the money. There was, no, there was nothing delayed. Nobody was going to look at it and take it apart later. Nobody was going to give it to somebody. It had no purpose. And so by removing the purpose and making the only purpose the money, an extrinsic motivator, people's output dropped dramatically. Okay? So thinking about your values, it's important that your values are intrinsic, things that you can believe in as a group, that you find commonality and value, purpose, and not extrinsic. It doesn't mean that extrinsic things don't exist and you can ignore them, but it means that you don't live and die by them in a sense. Um, and that can be hard. Uh, communities are structured uh, differently, but nonetheless, while you may have to live with that reality, um, it's important that your values are guiding because that's what's going to sustain the changes and, and be a, a, a piece to actually create the change. So knowing your values, um, you need to ask yourself as a leader and if you have a level four tribe, making sure that these are the kind of questions that you're having um, with your group. Overall, this has to do with why you exist, why you do what you do, and why you're in some ways better than alternatives. Okay? So first of all, what do you believe and value as a leader? And if you don't know, or you think you know, but you're not sure, that's okay. Um, a lot of people sort of have a gut sense, but they, don't, they, they can't articulate that on the spot. It's important that you put time and effort into thinking through that for yourself, first and foremost, because you need to be able to articulate that. Here at No Adam, we know what we believe in and what we value, and it holds us together. Um, we know when something doesn't fit. Um, it defines our culture and our climate, um, and it helps us make good decisions and sustainable change. Um, does your team share those values? So once you ask yourself that question as a leader, are, you, are your values and what you believe at odds with your team? Because that's basically where you need to start. You need to start with that language that people can hear, um, but you need to start the conversation around values. What do people value? And try to come to some consensus. consensus. Find some common threads and begin building on it. Um, are the values extrinsic or intrinsic? And how do you and your team communicate these? Do you celebrate them? Because if you don't communicate your values and you don't celebrate them, they pretty much don't exist. Um, they're going to become fractured over time. Your team's going to fall apart. Your cu culture's going to degrade. Um, it's important to communicate and celebrate what you value. Um, yes, there are the realities of testing, accountability, and all these sort of things. That's part of life. Okay, but what we value most is most important. Okay, and we need to rally around those things. So uh, I'm basically at Q and A here. Um, a clear path forward for how you can move your tribe's culture to the next stage is really kind of three three basic steps. First and foremost, you need to speak language that can be heard by your tribal members um, or by the tribes that you are leading. Number two, uh, you need to shift the language one level at a time. And you can do it quickly, um, but you need to go level by level. So if somebody is at I, you need to be shifting towards we. 
that's the language, that's the discussion, um, and I can give you a little example of that in a minute. And then identifying common values. And there's some, you know, we could debate uh, what order these need to come in, but if people are not thinking about we, it's very hard to think about things that are in common. Um, they can maybe happen in parallel, because as you talk about your values, a sense of we can emerge. Um, but it's first and foremost important that the language can be heard. Because if somebody's down at the stage two level thinking, my life stinks, my teaching stinks, I'm a tortoise, uh, and this is a tortoise school, and somebody's on the other side saying, hey, wait, you know, I'm a level four person, we can be great, um, it's, it's like you might as well be on different channels on a radio. Okay, so a little scenario, um, well, I'll hold off on the scenario. I'd like to take some questions here before we, uh, before we jump into anything else. So if, uh, and I know we've gone over a little bit here, if you uh, don't have a chance to have your question answered, this is my contact information. So I'm Francis Vigent, uh, fvigent at noadam.com. Uh, you would have gotten a confirmation email uh, with my address on it. Uh, or maybe Mary Ellen reached out to you. Um, you can reach out to her, forward your questions to her, uh, and to me through her. That's fine. Um, and I want to let you know that uh, in terms of webinars, we do have a fall webinar series going on. There's about a dozen or so webinars. Some may be of interest to you. There is a couple coming up um, on leadership specifically, but next generation science standards, the difference between curriculum and standards and all kinds of things. You can find that at this link. Follow us on Twitter or also kind of keep uh, in the loop on Facebook. So what I'd like to do is take a look at the questions. And um, depending on the questions, I'll jump into that scenario as well. So just give me one moment to take a look through here. Okay, so this is a really great question. So, uh, uh, so this person asked um, that they basically have uh, members of their school and district who are from all different tribe levels, and um, but yet the majority are level three or level four. Would the implementation of new next generation uh, science standards be easier for all members? of varying levels if it were phased in grade level by grade level or if it was phased in unit by unit in each grade level. What are my thoughts on this? Um, so basically, the uh, key here is not really, so um, the, the key is not to go grade level by grade, it's, not, it's, it's neither of what was suggested. It's not grade level by grade level um, and it's not a few units at each grade level. What it is is it's to go to the level four people um, and level three people, or really put it out to everyone, but the level three and level four people are the people who are going to come forward um, and implement there first. Because if you implement there first, what's going to happen is, is that it's going to, one, the level three person is going to have a chance to be the best if they want to take it. And the level four person is going to be able to say, you know, look at how great this is for our community. And so you're going to start to have that, if that level three person is in agreement, the level three person is going to start to shift over to that level four type language and really be thinking about, yeah, I'm behind this. I, this is change that I can lead. And in fact, I can lead this, help lead this whole school um, because, yeah, this is something that's really good for all of us and I can be a part of it. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to kind of go in. The, the problem with a, a unit at each grade level is, is that you know, everyone's going to have a bone to pick. Um, and the people who are going to really be doing it for uh, sort of kind of this belief in the, in the higher purpose of what's going on are going to be those level four people or the high level threes. And so um, they're the ones that are going to be able to kind of instigate and carry the change. Um, people that are at those really the lowest levels, they're not going to even hear it. They're not going to see the purpose of it. And they're going to, because they don't see purpose, they're either going to try to kill it or they're just going to let it die on the vine. So I, I would suggest that you really think about putting it out there, of course, to everybody. But 
expect level threes and level fours to come forward and see that as a positive sign. Push the lead in that direction, push the language up to that level four, level five language, and then use that as a stepping stone to help um, you know, solidify and communicate your values. And what you're going to find is, is that, especially if this is a, uh, a quality implementation, so you have you know, cohesive curriculum, it's supporting teacher background, it has the standards alignment, it has the materials and the professional development, all of these pieces are together, then people's lives aren't going to stink. So <laughs> it's going to be easy to shift the people out of level two. They're going to see that. They're going to say, wow, my life would be better if I had that. Whoop, I'm going to sl I want to be over there. So they're going to start moving themselves up. Um, level three people are saying, wow, you know, I can't be the best doing what I'm doing anymore because that's better. Look at it. I'm going to shift over there. And so it's going to cause a natural gravity in the group. And actually, that's how we recommend, even with our own solutions, um, that's how we approach it because we do bring those parts together and we do focus on what matters. Um, that's why you see our, our tagline, focus on what matters. It's about these beliefs. It's about why we're teachers. Um, what we teach reflects why we're teachers. Um, and, that, and that only makes sense. So if you have any other questions or if that um, there's another nuance on that you want to ask, feel free to, to reach out. Um, the, the little scenario I was going to give you was really uh, kind of thinking back to where we were here. Um, you know, as a principal, so you might find yourself in another flavor of the question that was just asked, where you have a bunch of, let's say, level two teachers and a few level three teachers and nobody who's level four or level five. And you see yourself as a level four, level five person. You've got you've got some clear vision, you are, you know, you feel like you have these really intrinsic values, um, you know, you're, you're in it to win it, but you're in it to win it not for data, but for sort of the opportunity and the, the critical thinking and the, the, the potential of, of the child. And so how do you get that level two, level three teacher there? Well, one thing sort of uh, in that scenario we were just thinking about, you might think about is here's, it's about extending the reach. So that's how this works. When you're shifting the language, you're extending the reach. So, so what you want to do is probably think if you can target that level three teacher or teachers um, and extend their reach into a level four by inviting them to really uh, help sort of lead you, uh, in a sense, your understanding, but then to participate in helping to lead the school and to be able to help um, define the values and to help um, you know, bring things forward that everyone else should be doing. So one kind of comment you might make is, you know, it's clear that you're deeply invested in XYZ elementary school. Uh, you know, would you be willing to help me learn about the three weeks of test prep that we do in March? So this might be something that a, a level three person is really invested in. Oh, test preparation, yeah, that's how you become the best. I know, I do it every year, and I have the best scores, and I'm the best. Okay, it might be something you're really at odds with as a level four, level five person. You don't want to shut down school for three weeks to do test prep. So you need to remember you, you speak a language that they can hear. So they can hear about being the best. You know, that's what they're going to kind of view this as. So in this example, you're inviting someone who thinks they're better than you to show you that they're better than you and to offer. That's kind of an offer that's hard for them to pass up. So the twist comes in, because this person's a level three person, you need to think of extending the reach. So how you can do this is by saying something like, you know, given what you've shared, how can we ready students in the context of lessons instead of concentrating it just in a month of test prep? How can we spend a whole year doing test prep but do it as part of the lesson? And so now you've sort of redefined the scenario and, and you've invited them to help sort of, you know, brainstorm and find solutions. And then you may want to follow up with something kind of like this where how can we help XYZ Elementary School 
adopt those practices and share those practices. And so what happens is, is it's sort of, it's, you always want to be truthful, but it's sort of in a way almost a, a sort of a little sneaky here where you're using somebody's nature against them because they want to be the best, they want to be the leader, they want to be recognized, and you're going to create that opportunity or they're going to perceive it as that opportunity. But what you're going to do is, is you're going to pivot it around and you're going to have a discussion about values. And what's going to happen is, is you're going to find that um, you can pivot that discussion towards higher values. Do we really value taking a month to do test prep? Do we really want to do test prep in every lesson? Or do we want every less lesson to be so good, so engaging, that it actually prepares the students for the test? What is it we really value? And so there you just literally kind of turned it, in, in the course of a, probably a conversation or two, around uh, to now you have somebody who can begin to engage at a level four level. It doesn't mean that it's instant, um, but what in, in the person may ultimately not go along with it either. Um, but the key is, is that if they accept, um, you have an opportunity to not only help the group as a whole, but you have your first level four person. And you can kind of build that relationship and alignment and begin to shift everybody else too. Um, level twos in some ways are kind of a little bit easier because because their life stinks, um, if if you are a level four, level five person, by sort of um, helping address the need, um, they're going to have maybe some gripes about how it's addressed. But if they're they're going to be relatively grateful that they don't have that need anymore, and so what that's going to do is is it's going to shift them into level three. Well, my life doesn't stink. I'm better than I was, I'm the best, oh wait a minute, how can I be better? And so actually I, I find that moving level two people to level four is much quicker and easier than trying to move level three people to level four, but, but that's something to kind of, it's very, you know, the people, obviously we're all human, circumstances are nuanced, people are nuanced, and so we're talking in kind of broad generalities here, but, um, but that's, you know, more often than not um, kind of a scenario there. Any other questions? Let's see here. Um, we have one question about um, about some strategies in terms of it's a specific situation. So what I would say is, if you have um, specific situations, you know, feel free to email. Um, my email is at the top of the screen. Um, Another uh, thing you can do um, is feel free to join. We have a, an upcoming webinar, sort of how to be a helpful leader without losing focus or control. Um, and w during that webinar, we're going to talk a lot more about the sort of, um, sort of the tactical side of, of how you can sort of manage and shift tribes. Um, it looks like we have a couple of those questions and really none others. So. While you're all here, um, I suppose I've given you an awful lot to think about. So um, again, feel free to reach out. I appreciate your time. I apologize that we have gone over a bit, um, but I'm glad that we've been able to have this discussion. And um, thank you again, really, for taking the time and the interest to engage. Um, it's so important that, again, that we recognize that not only are we dealing with individuals, but we're dealing with groups that have very specific behaviors that can evolve over time as sort of tribes evolve. Um, but if we can recognize them early and we can work with them and we have these tools and strategies, what we can do is uh, we, can bring, we can come together around a core values that help us to really reach a higher level and, and maintain a focus and reach a destination that we couldn't reach on our own with sort of a command and control structure. So thank you again. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all and thank you for your questions. I look forward to any emails and hopefully seeing you in the future on another webinar. Take care. Bye-bye.